is for me a great honor to introduce Tim Williamson, who is a weekend professor of logic at the University of Oxford since uh, 2000, I believe. Uh, the team is, is I mean, widely known, I mean, everybody knows in this room and, and uh, I mean, online who, who Tim is. So I, I, mean, I really wouldn't need to say anything. Just, just let me uh, uh, list some of the main uh, things that he did. He contributed with many works uh, to core issues in, in logic, Build of language, uh, epistemology, and metaphysics, and in, in in many cases, his words shaped the discussions on those on those topics. So that that, that is what uh, makes him really uh, an important uh, uh, philosopher uh, nowadays. And let me list just a, 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 his books because the paper would be too many. So. Uh, Starting, I mean, chronological order, uh, uh, identity and discrimination, 1990, vagueness, 1994. Uh, perhaps that, that is my favorite one. Uh, knowledge and its limits, 2000. Uh, philosophy of philosophy, 2007. Modern logic as metaphysics, 2013. Uh, Tetralogue, I'm right, you're wrong, 2015. Uh, doing philosophy, 2018. Uh, suppose I can tell semantics and heuristics of, of conditionals 2020. And then there are also other topics on which he wrote articles, but instead of books, but uh, who, which uh, really uh, contributed uh, in a very, I mean, uh, important way to the discussion. And for example, there, there is this uh, uh, long article on absolute generality, uh, which has been uh, very widely debated and uh, it's, it's an excellent piece of work. So, so there are many, many things. Uh, so we are very happy to have Tim uh, here uh, for our lecture. We, I mean, this series of lecture is uh, uh, relatively short compared to other, you know, more prestigious and well-known series. We started seven years ago, so this is the seven. But, uh, but I have to say that I, I'm pretty happy of the uh, speakers that we have, and, and, and especially now with, with Tim, with Tim, I. Uh, particularly uh, proud of, of uh, having him uh, as a lecturer. So, uh, so I, I leave you the floor. Uh, once we finish with the, with the talk, then I, I will collect the questions and I will ask people to come here in front of the camera to ask the question. So we don't have to pass the microphone. Okay. So here. Are. Right. Thank you, thank you very much. So I, th I guess I should, I should first um, share my screen. Um, okay. Um, sorry, I've, I'm, let me just, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so my, my uh, title today is, is knowing by sight and knowing by, uh, proof. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just, I want to. To minimize something here, that, yeah, um, good. Um, and once once again, ap apologies um, not to be with you in uh, in person. Um, I mean, there were, as you can imagine, practical uh, reasons. But I'm I'm so disappointed um, not to be um, in Turin again. Um, oh. Sorry. Now, something has happened here because I can't I can't control my screen. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and then we'll we'll try again. I'm really sorry about this, but um, so I don't I don't know why that is. But I, but some I, I when I tried it 
uh, the other day, there was no problem. But let's 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 just try again. And um, I wasn't able to to change the slide. So. Um, no, it's the. Uh, can, can you do that now? Please? No, it's. Um, it, I'm sharing my screen. Yes. I, yes. I don't. I don't understand wh why. I don't know. I mean, I'm. I'm no expert on these things. I. I. I simply. I'm not getting. I mean, I'm not, it's not responding when I try to go to the next slide. So, uh, so if you if you if you press, the, I mean, if you click on the slide, uh, click on the. Slide. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and and what do I do to click to click back again? Um, if I. So I should not, not try to use the arrows. Uh, so you said arrows. Use the arrows. Ah, so the they say. All right. Th thank you very much. Um, so I so this looks as though it will will work. Um, uh, so they say that. Sorry, but that uh, it, it would be safer with the arrows in the yes. Use them instead yeah. of uh, the mouse. Yes. Okay. I'll 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 use the arrows. Uh, that, that that's good. So sorry about about this. I um, so um, so I want to talk about about the the similarities and differences between um, knowing by sight and uh, n knowing by uh, proof, um, and uh, you know. When one first thinks about the contrast for, as a, a, a philosopher, um, it tends to seem like a gigantic uh, difference um, because uh, knowing by sight is uh, a paradigm of a posteriori uh, knowledge um, that, as it were, to use the standard formulation, that it's uh, dependent on uh, experience um, and uh, knowing by uh, Proof is a paradigm of um, a priori knowledge. Sorry, I'm going to pronounce a posteriori and a priori in the barbaric English uh, way, um, <clears throat> and so, which is supposed to be independent of experience. I mean, as it were, that's the standard way of thinking about the uh, the relation uh, between them. And then that that's supposed to be a very uh, profound uh, difference. Um, I mean, I think. Of course, th there are all sorts of um, questions to be asked about um, the, the the way that that distinction between the two kinds of knowledge is uh, drawn, um, partly about what kind of uh, dependence uh, and, and standardly a, a distinction is made between um, the the dependence on experience in its um, role um, as providing evidence uh, contrasted with dependence on experience uh, in its role as simply enabling one to uh, to to understand the the terms of a question. So one might you know one might need uh, experience to to understand um, what. Um, being red and being coloured um, mean, but not need it once you have understood them to answer the question, are all red things coloured? I mean, that's a kind of standard example. Um, and of course, there are also questions about uh, what is um, meant by the term experience. Um, is it restricted to sense experience or uh, does it also apply to what's sometimes called inner experience? Um, and 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 then uh, in relation to um, the uh, the case uh, that I'm going to be talking about, um, the, of course there is the um, experience of uh, going through uh, a proof. 
um, and that which is not, as it were, the kind of experience that people usually have in mind when they're talking about these matters, but it nevertheless does seem to be some kind of uh, experience. Um, and so what I'm going to be arguing in this lecture um, is that the distinction between um, the a, a priori and a posteriori is um, superficial, as it were, in um, in, in terms of Plato's uh, metaphor, it, it, it does not cut uh, at a joint. Um, so th this this is something that that I have uh, argued uh, before, but I I want to approach uh, the 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 question from a, a different angle in in this uh, this talk. Um, so. I'm going to approach it in a way which bypasses the question of how to define uh, the a priori and the a posteriori. So I'm, I won't be worrying about, as it were, the fine tuning of notions of uh, dependence and uh, experience. Um, and I'm I'm not going to be disputing the question, uh, I mean, the claim that, that some knowledge is, is a priori and some is a posteriori. I'm going to uh, assume that, that that is indeed uh, the case and that, as it were, we do, in fact, um, have you know, a, a, a reasonable uh, capacity to, um, to distinguish uh, in particular cases between a priori and a posteriori knowledge that we're not wildly wrong in the way uh, that we that we apply uh, those categories to uh, particular uh, examples. Um, so I, I'm going to adopt a, a different style of argument rather than as we were trying to problematize the, those uh, particular definitions, which which might then simply provoke somebody to try to find better definitions. Um, oops. Oh, dear. Um, Something's happened with my. Oh. Um, sorry, the, the controls, the different controls are now working from the ones that were working before for some reason that I don't understand. Apologies. Um, so instead, I'm going to be arguing um, that paradigms of a priori knowledge are so close to paradigms of a posteriori knowledge that the distinction is much less informative than epistemologists usually take it to be. So, as it were, what I'm going to be doing is taking um, classic cases of a priori knowledge and classic cases uh, of a posteriori knowledge and um, arguing that they're really much closer together than one might uh, think. And therefore, that, that we're not really dealing with, um, with a very deep distinction. I mean, it's, it's not simply that that the, there are some borderline cases where it's hard to know whether to classify them as a priori or, or a posteriori, because that would not be especially interesting because most distinctions uh, have borderline uh, cases. Uh, it, it's rather that classic cases on the two sides are close together. Um, so just, just to give you a feel for what I mean by um, by talking about a distinction as being superficial, um, I'll give a couple of uh, examples. Um, so one, uh, as it were, toy example is uh, the distinction between red and non-red bicycles. I mean, that's a perfectly genuine distinction. Some bicycles are red and others are not. Um, but it, it's clearly a very superficial distinction. Um, I mean, in literally um as as well as in the more as uh, well theoretical sets of of superficial i mean you can change which a bicycle is just by painting it um and 
you know, if one was giving a theory of bicycles, the the distinction between red and non-red ones would not play any significant role in in such a theory if it was any good. Um, I think a, a more interesting example is, I mean, let's let's take uh, um, some kind of crazy um, race scientist who who partitions um, all humans in, into mutually ex exclusive, jointly exhaustive um, so-called races by some kind of, you know, more or less arbitrary distinction about uh, their the DNA. Um, then, I mean, these, I mean, people would belong to one or other of, um, of, of these so-called races, but but the dis but the distinctions would not be uh, as it were uh, uh, ones of any theoretical interest either biologically or uh, socially um, uh, or culturally. So th that um, so that they would be uh, as it were in, in this sense genuine but superficial distinctions. So um, so that's that's the kind of thing that uh, this kind of status that I'm suggesting that the a priori, a posteriori uh, distinction uh, has. Um, okay, so I, I want to, um, what I want to discuss an uh, example and, uh, and to, as it would drill down um, into it to, to see what's uh, going on. The um, the example that I that I have in mind is this. Um, so, uh, imagine a a mathematician um, who who produces a a, a proof um, of a new theorem or or what she what she hopes is a, is a proof. Um, and so she she's sort of writing away and it, it seems to be working out. But by the time she's got it all written down, um, she's uh, she's exhausted. Um, she she goes uh, to bed and so to, to sleep on it. And then uh, when she's uh, refreshed the next morning, um, she she comes um, to um, to check the the proof or purported proof that she wrote down. I mean, by, uh, as it were, at the time when she goes to bed, she's, she's not, she's not yet convinced that the proof is correct. So she definitely doesn't know um, the truth of the theorem or the correctness of the proof at that stage, because she doesn't even really uh, yet it, uh, fully accept it. Um, but then, but then she, she goes through the, the proof uh, very carefully um, and checks it, and we can assume that it, it, everything checks out, and it turns out this is indeed a correct uh, proof of the uh, theorem, and uh, and so that that looks like um, a case of um, a priori uh, knowledge. I mean, it's it's a, a sort of classic type of, of example of uh, knowledge knowledge through mathematical. Uh, proof, or, or you could, if you wanted to make it a purely logical proof, uh, you could. That wouldn't that wouldn't make much difference to the um, the arguments I'm going to uh, to make. Um, but let's let's just uh, think about what might be going on in her checking. Um, and so the kind of thing that she'll be uh, doing is, um, for example, uh, checking that um, that some step really is a step of modus uh, ponens, so that it is a, a step of the form if a then c and then the second premise a and a conclusion um, c. I mean, of course, if we're, we're being more realistic about working mathematicians. Um, the, the the sort of checking that they would do would be at a slightly more macroscopic scale. It wouldn't be 
quite at the level of modus ponens, but but I'm taking it that that's that's not really a difference in principle, and just for the the sake of um, clarity and so that we know exactly what's uh, going on, let's uh, let's take the the case of uh, modus uh, ponens. Um, so she's she's verifying that what she has got um, written down in her notebook is a case of modus uh, ponens. Um, and what's really going on here, it seems, is a case of something like pattern recognition, um, that she's us using her uh, visual recognitional capacities to identify um, a, a particular instance of modus ponens. And of course, it, in the background here is the fact that she does know that modus ponens is a, um, a valid uh, rule of inference um, that, that's being taken uh, for granted. What we're concerned with is the, the particular way in which um, she's uh, using that background knowledge to check the correctness of a particular proof in front of her. Um, and uh, as I say, it, 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 she's got something like a, um, a, a visual recognitional capacity uh, for, for modus ponens. Um, I mean, you, of course, one might ask, well, is that for modus uh, ponens in general or just for modus ponens um, in, in English? And um, and of course, really, it's just a a, a, um, a, a visual recognition capacity for uh, modus ponens in English, because um, it, you know if you were to present her with an instance of um, modus ponens uh, in Italian, if she doesn't know Italian, she's not going to be able to identify it as an instance uh, of uh, of modus ponens. Um, so, th so this is, as it were, uh, in in that respect, it's uh, it's a quite specific recognitional capacity. It depends on the presence of something like the word "if" um, there on the page, and uh, it wouldn't work with a, a synonym in another language that she doesn't know. Um, and I mean, the kind of um, skill that one might compare this to is um, is pattern recognition in uh in chess but uh, by particularly let's say by a a grand uh grandmaster um and i mean that th those um skills uh have um have certain uh limitations as well that that don't simply depend on the abstract pattern on the chessboard i mean for example um the grandmaster who can recognize uh patterns on the uh, on the chessboard um visually um probably won't be able to recognize them um by uh, by touch because after all touch doesn't tell you whether a piece is black or or white so um you wouldn't expect it to to work in a tactile way so but so as it were i mean it might be that that this mathematician she that she can also identify modus ponens when she when she hears it but that would that would be a slightly different skill though of course not unrelated to the the first so um so what's going on is um is to some extent um specific to the the relevant uh sense uh sense modality even though as were modus ponens intrinsically as a, a logical move doesn't seem to be um dependent on on the sense of sight um so th the kind of judgment that she might make once she has recognized this instance of modus ponens is something like an instance of modus ponens is written there uh, and of course that's a, a classic example actually of a, a posteriori knowledge i mean you can't you can't know a priori what's written on a piece of uh, paper. I mean, you can't know a priori that uh, and there is uh, an instance of modus ponens is is written there. Um, I mean, you might say, well, it, it, the issue isn't whether it's written there, and it would be 
um, better to to describe her, her the content of her knowledge as something more like uh, this is an instance of modus ponens, and so maybe that would be uh, a priori. Um, but the the difference between the, the two uh, doesn't seem very very large, particularly because um, the this um, is I mean the demonstrative there. Um, is a, a a visual perceptual demonstrative. I mean, it's it's uh, its reference is secured by the the position on the on the page. So it's only very slightly different from an instance of modus ponens um, is is written here, um, and and so if um, I mean we could classify this as an instance of modus ponens as a priori, even though an instance of modus ponens is written there as a posteriori. I mean, I don't, uh, I, I, I'm not saying we, that, that that would be wrong, but if it's right, then then that would also help to make the point that I'm making that, um, as it were, the, the kind of um, knowledge that, uh, that seems uh, relevant to uh, mathematical um, proof uh, is so close to um, perceptual uh, knowledge of the and and so as it were a classic case of the a priori. It seems so close to a classic case of the a posteriori. By the way, well, while I think about, I, I should just mention that I'm going to be talking in in, in terms of um, a priori and a posteriori knowledge all the way through because that's that's my own epistemological uh, preference, but. Um, but the, the same issues would arise if we were talking about uh, justification rather than the knowledge. So that, as we're, that, that's that's not I, not I think the focus of the the issues that I'll be uh, talking about. Um, now, of course, w one move that friends of the uh, a priori a posteriori distinction might make is to say, well. Um, it may be when you do it on paper, it's um, all you get is a um, a posteriori uh, knowledge. But surely when you do it in your head, then you get uh, a priori uh, knowledge. Um, so let's just reflect a bit on, on, on what would be implied in making such a big deal of the distinction between doing something on paper versus doing it in your in your head. Um, so well one point to make is that um, from the, the mathematician's point of view, um, the difference is is not a big deal except that um, there are certain advantages in doing it on paper. I mean so one of those um, is is roughly to do with with surveyability. Um, so um, you know we we can we're, we're in modern mathematics we're we're typically dealing with proofs which are too complicated to get all in your head at the same uh, at the same time. Um, and and so uh, from a practical point of view, uh, doing it on on paper is is a necessity. Um, and um, and and though e even if, as it were, with the individual steps, as for, for example, with an individual step of modus ponens, we can, uh, as it were, fit the step into uh, into a single act of uh, consciousness. Um, checking the proof isn't simply a matter of checking individual steps. It's also a matter of checking that all the individual steps do, in fact. Fit uh, together um, that that you you don't don't have just lots of as it were uh, r random instances of uh, in correct inference rules that that don't add up to a proof of of what um, you see at the at the end and the, the fitting them all together that seems to be like something that um, that may require you know. Something pretty much like um, you know a written record of the the proof to 
uh, to track uh, all those uh, things and and for any genuine check that they do all fit to uh, together. Um, and and so the, the, as I say that that's um, that may well it, it self introduce a need for writing. Now, of course, somebody could say, well, th these are just contingent limitations of human beings. Um, and in principle, there could be superhumans um, who can do all of this in their heads. I mean, they just have a vastly um, more um, capacious uh, consciousness and and a vastly um, more, more stable uh, memory and uh, and so on than than we have. Um, and I, I'm not going to dispute that, but the important thing to see is that it doesn't really make any difference. Uh, I mean, the possibility of such superhumans doesn't make any difference to the status of um, human knowledge in these cases, because as it were, our only reason for thinking that the superhumans could check the paper in their heads is that we've checked it uh, on paper. Um, and so we're still relying on our uh, as were, checks on paper. And and so at most of what we'd get from this is that we have, um, by checking on paper, we get knowledge that that superhumans could do, do it in this other way. But that doesn't mean that that we are doing it in this other way that that relies uh, uh, only on what happens in our heads. Um, and I, I mean, a second way in which, um, from a mathematician's point of view, uh, the written proof <laughs> is actually better than the proof in, <clears throat> in one's head is, um, is um, the public uh, checkability. So that, as it were, the this is, one might say the uh, equivalent of um, the the repeatability of experiments in in natural science is the fact that the other people um, can check the uh, proof and make sure that it's okay. And of course, um, journal refereeing is one um, salient mechanism for that. But but often um, by the time things have got into a, a stage of journal. Uh, refereeing that they've been checked, but by uh, seminars of you know of, of in of leading centres of of mathematics, if they're if they're really important uh, proofs and those kind of things. Um, so, so those are some ways in which, from a practical point of view, doing it in one's head is actually worse than doing it on paper. Um, but in some other respects. Um, there's actually much less difference between the two processes than um, one might think, because um, the, the imagining it in one's head actually seems to be something like the offline version of um, seeing it uh, on on paper. In the case of a of a Proof. So as where well, the online is just the perception and the offline is the imagining, but um, the, but the imagining is as it were some kind of offline simulation of the perceptual uh, process. So that, for example, in checking the the proof um, offline uh, in, in the imagination, one may be using uh, the same visual recognitional capacities that one would use um, in the in the online um, case on paper, um, but just using them uh, offline, um, and uh, and so this is again, w w you know, a natural analogy is what the, a chess uh, master might be um, doing that 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 they could see a con a configuration on a chessboard and they could imagine a configuration on a chessboard and the imagining seems to be something like the offline version of, of actually seeing it and the and the visual recognitional capacities uh there would be uh pretty much the same ones just used in these two different uh modes um so 
as I say, you, you could you could say that the online version is a posteriori and that that the offline version with the imagining it in one's head is a priori. But um, but the the two processes are very close together and the and the order of cognitive dependence um, may may not be the one that, as it were, uh, epistemologists ha have tended to suppose. I mean, I guess that the uh, as epistemologists have tended to think of the um, the online process of seeing it on paper as just a kind of um, uh, some sort of crutch that gets one to uh, the real thing, which is imagining it in one's head. But it, in fact, I, it seems to me that it's probably the other way around, that the imagining it in one's head is just, as it were, a, the transfer of online skills uh, uh, offline. Um, and that, so in that sense, is in a way, it is dependent on the process of seeing it on paper. Not, of course, not on, on that particular process, because you may not have seen it on paper, but, but on that general kind of uh, process. Um, so, so just thinking in terms of, as it were, is it in the head or on paper, doesn't seem to be getting at anything tremendously uh, important about the process of verifying the, uh, the proof. So uh, I think a, a different and more abstract uh, suggestion um, is that the, the real um, distinction is between the form of the proof and its content, um, and and that going through the as it were the written version of the proof um, is either either uh, on paper or just as Im imagined um, is. Is simply a, as a way of a, enabling one to uh, to come to uh, to to acquaint one with the real proof, which is the as it were the content, um, and and that the, the writing just pertains to the the form, which which is simply as it were some kind of a shell that, that takes you to the content. Um, now. That seems to me a very dubious conception in the case of proof, and in particular, um, in the case of uh, formal proof, because I, as well, the whole um, point of formal uh, proof, I mean, the point that, it, you know, the way it goes back to um, in some form to well to Leibniz or even to you, you might say Euclid, um, is that the the process of checking is is a mechanical one um, that uh, a, the proof could in principle be checked um, by a, a computer, um, and and so. If we're saying that the real proof uh, is something that um, is, as we're just that the that the form of the proof is, is something that we can throw away once we've got to the the real proof, the content. With what what we're throwing away is, in fact, um, the the very thing that enables us to um, to get what's supposed to be the um the epistemic value of formal proof i that we can we've got this special way of checking it um and you know, in the case of um for example modus uh, ponens um if we think of modus ponens as um the the, the particular um form that that one can write down, um, then it's easy to see how a computer can can check that as it were, it, um, you know, 
I mean, it's obviously it's got to have some way of inputting the um, the visual form of the of the proof, and and um, and then um, and so it's got to be able to recognise the symbols. But beyond that, it, it's simply a, a mechanical um, matter. Um, and you know, if you look at the um, the natural uh, deduction rules for a logical um, system. I mean, it seems like, like um, you know, th those are things that we check by this this kind of pattern recognition that could, in principle, be done by a, a computer. Um, and I mean, when you see the introduction and elimination rules, let's say for the uh, for first order logic laid out, I mean, basically you're being presented with uh, a, a number of these. Uh, visual patterns, and and those are the, um, I mean, the first order logic is the background logic for at least a lot of of mathematics. Maybe we need second order logic, but uh, for some, but but that would that would also um, correspond to uh, with just some more visual patterns, um, and and so. You know, it seems that, that uh, whereas if we thought, let's say, of modus ponens as pure content, um, then so, for example, you know, if, if you had some some notion of content that abstracted away from the the structure of the sentences that conveyed the, the content. I mean, there, um, there are such notions of content. For example, if one thought of the the content uh, of a sentence as a, a the set of possible worlds where it's true or something like that then uh it's it's completely unclear if if as well one was just re as in thought once one had got to the real proof one was just engaging with these sets of possible worlds how you would check that you were dealing with an instance of modus uh, ponens um and again although in sophisticated mathematics people are not going to be spending their time mainly worrying about as were the microscopic um moves like um like modus ponens they're going to be looking for more microscopic as patterns patterns which are uh it's much harder to perceive um i mean the issue about form versus content will will still be basically the same and, and you, you'll still want a a perspicuous uh notation to facilitate recognizing uh, these these patterns. Um, so, uh, of course, I mean, you might think, well, this, this emphasis on um, on formal proof is, is a is a bit of a, a sort of as were a philosopher's uh, artifact uh, because um, mathematicians are mostly not dealing with with formal proofs, you know, in a specified uh, calculus. Um, but actually, the the situation in contemporary mathematical practice is um, is not quite like that because um, a lot of the the proofs that are a key in contemporary mathematics are enormously complicated proofs proofs that that may uh, take hundreds or in some cases even thousands of pages to write. I, I mean, to, uh, to it, you know, simply when they're printed, um, and and each page is, is something that could only be checked uh, with with considerable difficulty, um, and so uh, what what is happening increasingly is that mathematicians, um, for practical reasons, because they're dealing with proofs that are so complex that it's really very hard to be sure that they are uh, correct just by traditional methods, are using um, proof assistant. Uh, programs which are kind of interactive so as where you you're inputting the proof and then um where the um the the program doesn't recognize a step or or or, or it's not familiar with the uh, the notation or the language that you've used it will ask for clarification um and and, and through this kind of interactive process what you get is um a, a program that gradually turns the sort of proof sketch that the human mathematician originally provided into a formal 
proof. And I mean, this this has quite recently been used by, for example, Peter Schultz, who's one of the leading mathematicians in the world at the at the moment, a Fields Medalist, and so on. And and it took you know it took him some months of this kind of interaction, but eventually the result was a formal proof. So that there is a sense in which it for, forgetting about you know all the sorts of things that philosophical logicians might think are going on, just in practice in contemporary mathematics, there is a, a serious way in which formal proof is operating as the epistemological uh, gold standard for checking proofs. Um, so, so it seems uh, to me that this uh, idea that um, the that the, as it were, the form of the the proof uh, is kind of uh, is some sort of shallow ir irrelevance that that once you've understood the proof that you you can you can throw away like the, the ladder is it's really uh, getting the epistemology of uh, proof seriously um, wrong. Now, I mean, we might ask why um, the idea that that form is irrelevant has some kind of attraction. Why, uh, so, if if it's an illusion, uh, how come it's an illusion that that we're liable to succumb to? Um, and I think um, part of the answer to that is, is simply um, that. Uh, that we're very familiar with the way in which um, one can easily translate a proof in one language into a proof in another language, either a natural language or one can um, use different formal notations, and 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 where there's there's um, there's no real uh, epistemic loss or gain. So I mean, if you translate a, a proof in English into Italian and, and you replace if by say and so on it you know that that's neither a, that doesn't seem to make any any interesting mathematical difference at least for people who understand both uh, languages I mean that of course some notation is actually a bit more perspicuous th than that like the arrow seems to be a rather perspicuous way of representing conditionals but that but that isn't crucial for, for mathematical proof as well the choice of those individual um, symbols um sorry um, and and so I think the fact that it, it doesn't within limits it doesn't matter what um, notation you use m may have helped to give the idea that the real proof is something that um, is kind of notation free. Um, but I think that's an illusion. It, it's in the same way that you know. The, the, I, for example, a, a given um, narrative story, um, it may be a story that can be told in any um, human natural language. Um, but that doesn't mean that, as it were, we can abstract away from the story and, and that it, it could somehow really be told in no language at all. It's, it's dependent on a language. It's just there's no particular language that it's dependent uh, on. So, so that's that's one way in which um, the the, the uh, an illusion of, of the irrelevance of uh, form might uh, arise. There's there's one other little point that it maybe is worth making that when when we talk um, about the um, getting. <laughs> abstracting away from the form to get to the content of the proof. That is sort of assuming that um, the, the individual um, formulas in the, in the proof um, all have a content. But of course, in a normal proof, um, you're, a lot of the time you're dealing with, with free variables, which don't actually have a, a content. They don't refer to uh, anything um, in, them, in themselves. Um, and even if you, uh, if in, in some way, um, you, you know, let's say you had two, um, for example, if you had two free variables that, that, that as it were given the, the constraints had in fact to uh, refer to the same uh, object, they needed to have the same value. Um, it still wouldn't be a valid instance of modus uh, ponens to go from one 
uh, to the other. So, so I mean, once you start thinking about what what the free variables are doing, the the idea of getting to the the underlying content becomes even more problematic. Um, oh, and one very brief uh, point to uh, to make is um, that. The kind of thing that I've been talking about in proof checking, it, it, it's also going on uh, all the time in proof uh, construction because proof construction involves um, all, all sorts of proof checking of particular steps that one has done of, of lemmas and so on, so that the the two things are completely bound up with each other. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about as uh, were some. Um, evolutionary considerations that one that one might have um, about the, the as it were whether we're um, we're dealing with some kind of deep uh, cognitive or epistemological difference here um, and and so um, one one issue is that um, whether it, it's even the kind of story that would be one would need in order to think that that with the a priori we're dealing with quite different cognitive faculties from the cognitive faculties used um, in uh, a posteriori knowledge. Um, you know, it, it's it's worth um, raising a question about whether there's any realistic evolutionary story about how that might have happened, and um, so. You know, if we were really talking about the evolution of a special faculty for a priori cognition, that, and for example, um, you know, for people who think that that involves special things called intellectual seemings, that sort of kind of internalist view that you get in, for example, George Beeler and Paul Bogosian, um, it, it's very hard to see why um, why that what the evolutionary value of uh, such a uh, faculty would. Would be now. Of course, um, th there is the phenomenon of uh, spandrels, which are things that have no uh, evolutionary, um, I mean, serve no evolutionary function in themselves, but are simply byproducts of things that that do serve such a function. And so, it could be claimed that, as it were, the, the easiest way for e evolution to give us some things that really do have. Um, improve fitness is also to give us um, so, uh, some kind of a priori faculty, even though th that doesn't uh, help us to um, to pass on our genes or anything like like that. Um, but that doesn't seem uh, to be the most sort of plausible kind of of, um, of story. And um, I mean, it seems m much more plausible that uh, that what's going on is um, that that we're um, somehow re reapplying um, cognitive faculties that are needed more generally to the special case. And um, and if we think about the, the case of mathematical proof, I mean that does seem to be what is in, in fact going on. Of course, the the kind of evolution that we're talking about in much of it will actually be cultural evolution rather than biological evolution. So, I mean, if we just take the case of um, proof in geometry, because Euclid's system seems to be the the oldest example, as far as I know, of of um, formal uh, of a system for formal proof in mathematics. Um, I mean, you know, the geometry uh, emerged um, from the uses of, of procedures in you know, ancient Egypt, ancient Babylon, and so on, to, where, where which had to do with things like um, you know estimating crop yields, so that if, if you can measure the sides um, of a of a field by walking along, stepping along them, counting the steps, and then. And then, um, if if you got some way from once you know the the sides of a field for um, for estimating the um, the area of the field, that will tell you something about uh, the crop yield, um, which is what you want to know. And so, so it's those kind of things that geometry um, emerged from. Um, and, and and really, oh, 
none there should be none. Um, so really until the 19th century, it seems to me that, that, that um, geometry was taken as a study of physical space. Um, and all, all, of course, now when non-Euclidean geometry emerged, it, I mean, it turned uh, uh, that, 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 you know, we could, it, in the setting of modern uh, abstract mathematics, we can just uh, investigate uh, geometrical spaces with no particular uh, as as it were abstract mathematical structure ba basing various constraints with, with with no particular relation to physical space and the uh, the study of physical uh, space was sort of turned over to uh, to physics um, but um, of course it's still the case that even um, I mean m most mathematicians make very strong use of their capacity for spatial intuition of, of a broadly geometrical kind in thinking about um, about mathematics and uh, and that's why diagrams and spatial metaphors and so on are, are really crucial in in a lot of mathematics when mathematicians love them um, so so that that when in in the case of geometrical proof we're, we're not dealing with something that emerged as an a priori faculty we're, we seem to be dealing with something that had uh, um, th these much more practical and, um, and physically spatial uh, origins. And, um, and then gradually um, we found ways of filtering those out, but not with any kind of faculty of a priori um, intuition um, coming in as some kind of deus ex machina at any uh, point. Um, and uh, and I think w w in w in the way I've been talking about the uh, the, the role of um, the imagination um, as doing things um, offline that we were previously doing online. Um, I mean th th that capacity for uh, using the imagination, um, you know, to do things offline um, is. Is has, has obvious e evolutionary uh, value because um, in in decision making, for example, um, we uh, quite a lot of what we're doing is we're, we're trying to work out what the consequences of um, various uh, of taking various actions that are available to us, and and so we're we're kind of using our um, predictive capacity about what happens where if. We, such and such. We're using it offline um, because uh, it's too expensive, actually, to tr in practice often to try these options. You you just have to, as we predict, you have to simulate what would happen, and and the imagination and our capacity to do things offline enables us to do that. I mean, I, I don't want to say very much about that. Um, I think you know an, another. Um, way in which you you might try to root the a priori a posteriori distinction um in uh in evolutionarily plausible terms is by perhaps identifying it with the distinction between um the uh innate and acquired um knowledge um now of course the the, the innate acquired distinction is itself quite not, not nothing like as straightforward as one might uh, think in um, evolutionary terms, but also I, I, it's unlikely that drawing the distinction in that kind of way would really do uh, what it's uh, what it's supposed to do. But for epistemologists, I mean, so for example, there's there's quite a bit of um, evidence that um, that we have an innate fear of humans have an innate fear of snakes, and so that we let's say that that can be understood as innate knowledge that snakes are dangerous. But the idea that we know a priori that snakes are dangerous does not seem a particularly attractive one if one's interested in drawing you know, a deep epistemological uh, distinction. Um, and I think part of the reason for this is that you know if we make it a matter of innate versus acquired, then um, a lot of the innate knowledge is is still knowledge that comes from 
um, interaction with the uh, environment. It's just that um, at the it, with innate knowledge, it's interaction at the level of the species, and and with acquired knowledge, it's interaction at the level of the individual. And one might feel that that is not really such an I mean, it has some significance, but it, it's doubtful that it has very much uh, epistemological uh, significance. Um, and so, of course, um, it, it, if we're talking about something like modus uh, ponens, um, well, modus ponens for a natural language, that can't be innate because no particular natural language is innate. I mean, the, 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 the word if is not innate. Um, I mean, you could... If you're photo, you could say that 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 what's innate is modus ponens uh, for mental ease. Um, but um, of course, the, the proofs that we're interested in are not in mental ease. They're proofs in um, in some kind of natural language plus some formal symbols. So so mental ease doesn't really help that that much with checking uh, proofs. Um, and that, so finally, I'll just say a, a few things. Um, about why, if the distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori uh, seems, um, if it's if it's actually superficial, why should it seem uh, deep? Um, so, of course, a cynical answer would be that it, it seems deep because because we're um, we're so strongly influenced by uh, historical deference to to Kant and and others. And I mean, there might be something to that. Um, but I think another reason why the distinction may seem compelling is that um, there really is a difference um, between just thinking and, on the one hand, and perceiving and acting, um, which both of which in involve uh, interaction with one's uh, environment, um, and you know, and this is a distinction which uh, certainly applies to. Uh, to computers and robots and things that that uh, on the one hand there's internal processing and on the other hand there's inputting and outputting. So that I mean there is some kind of genuine uh, distinction um, there. But if we try to um, classify cognitive processes by this distinction, I think what what we're liable to end up doing, um, as we're, if we're applying it in the way that that makes the distinction. Um, Problematic is, is we're just classifying them by their final stage, but but that isn't going to lead us to an, an interesting or deep uh, distinction. So, for example, you know, if you take um, learning that not all swans are white, um, you know, let's say that you learn that by seeing a black uh, swan, um, and and then you make an inference from, from this swan is black to not all swans uh, are white. That would that would come out on the thinking side because the the last stage of that was the the deductive uh, inference, um, but um, but of course it, it, that's not how we want to classify such an example because we also want to look at the previous stages as well. So just looking at the the last stage is, um, is silly. Um, and, and, and once we look at the last stage, um, then, um, sorry, once we look at the previous stages, then all the kinds of difficulties that I've been raising come about. So, and yes, sorry, I said finally, but I, I'll just give two or three minutes. I hope I'm not going significantly over the hour um, to the question of whether this, what I'm advocating is really some kind of empiricism. Um, so, one thing is I'm not arguing that all knowledge or justification is a priori. Um, as I've made clear, I'm I, I'm okay with um, just going along with the kind of uh, the sort of off the cuff applications that philosophers would normally make of of, of knowledge. And um, and so as it were, I'm uh, if you know if you want to classify um, knowledge by mathematical proof uh, as a priori, that's okay with me. I, I'm just saying it's it's not going to get anything very deep. Um, and I'm also I'm not I'm certainly not arguing for classic forms of empiricism that, as were, for example, that that um, you know we, there's some kind of tabula rasa as in Locke or um, 
something like a, a general, an innate uh, similarity space for general inductive learning as you get in, uh, in Quine. Um, and uh, what everything that I've been saying is, um, it's perfectly consistent with the, you know, existence of some cognitive modules in the sense of Chomsky and Fodor. So, um, as it were, what, what certainly Chomsky would regard as a kind of rationalist, uh, component of, uh, of cognition. Um, and, and so one way of, of putting this is that the, the inputs can modify the program, but outputs may be sensitive to both the inputs and the original uh, program. I mean, that's why as well, this is not something that's just a purely, um, you know, in the long run, just a, a purely a matter of uh, experience independent of uh, in any kind of um, cognitive architecture. Um, and and so the, the final thing that I w want to, to say is, is that, you know, often when people attack the a priori a posteriori distinction that what they're really attacking is just the category of the a priori and they're you know that the, the a priori doesn't work the way that you, you think it does but i mean my view is actually that that standard stereotypes of the a posteriori may be just as inadequate as the standard stereotypes of the a priori that that, that they're i mean you know when you get beyond just saying, well, this happens through causal interaction with the environment or something like that, trying to specify it. I think um, you, the, you will also get to descriptions which no longer really make the a priori, a posteriori distinction natural. So, so I, I, I do not take myself to be arguing for anything uh, like uh, empiricism but but just for thinking that maybe we we need to start drawing the lines in different places from those from which we're used to drawing them in. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope I haven't gone on for too long. No. I'm... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um... So uh, I see many people uh, connected. So I think uh, we could, uh, you know, ask one question from from the room here and one question from you know from. Uh, so if you if you raise your hand, uh, Michele will will let me know uh, you know the, the names of, of uh, who is here. You know? Or maybe also write a question. In the or, or or maybe you can write a question in the chat. And so I, uh, we will go one and one, right? Okay, so let me first ask here in the room. Okay, Lorenzo Rossi. Please. So you, you come here and you uh, look at the camera. You come here and look at the camera. Yeah, you can take your Can I take one? Oh, okay, yeah. this is very weird, but hello, Jim, did you see you? And hello, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thanks for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, yeah, so I had a question in it's really a two part question, but so um, you have been discussing the uh, what you uh, what you've been describing as superficial differences between the a priori and, and posteriori. And I have to say, I'm very sympathetic um, with the overall project, but I was also wondering whether um, all the examples and cases you were discussing were somehow involving um, actual cognitive faculties, whereas it seems to me one can argue that the distinction between a priori and a posteriori involves some sort of hidden modal uh, force in the sense that you can think that the a priori things that you can know are, you know, cognitive processes that potentially involve sharpening of our cognitive abilities. And so, you know, you have briefly discussed this idea of considering, you know, versions of humans that have enhanced cognitive abilities, but it seems to me that you can still make a case that, you know, if you consider, you know, uh, stronger cognitive abilities, then we can perform mathematical proofs, we can, you know, perform certain deductions and so on. Um, whereas certainly if there is a red bike behind closed doors, then, you know, I can go to another world where my cognitive abilities are somehow, um, 
the better, but unless they involve the ability of seeing behind closed doors, I, I can't get, I can't have, you know, access to that kind of knowledge. So it, it seems to me that all the examples you were discussing did not consider this potential modal dimension, you know, that seems to have something to do with the distinction between a priori and a posteriori. Um, so I was wondering what you thought about that. And in connection with this, and this is actually where I want to go with all this, uh, you said that all you said is about knowledge, but could equally be about justification. And at the end, um, you were conceding that there were some differences in the cognitive processes, say, thinking versus perceiving, so the way in which we access uh, knowledge. But given this, doesn't this also suggest that, you know, we might have different accesses to knowledge that somehow reverberate, this different reverberates on different kind of justification? that is available for a priori on the one hand and a posteriori on the other. Okay, so this is- Yes, okay. so I, I'm not sure that I've I've entirely got um, what role for modality you're um, proposing. I mean, because the, you know, if, if we're just talking about the, the modal status of the the um the things known or, or for that matter justified um th then then you know we'd have to deal with um all the kripkean examples of the the necessary a posteriori and the um and the contingent uh, a priori and um and so um you know we we, we don't I mean, and in fact, I mean, the, the I mean, the distinction is really a distinction. I mean, the modal distinctions apply to the propositions, um, but they they don't apply to the um, the, the the agents uh, relation to the the proposition. So, but maybe that wasn't what you intended. Yeah, yeah. What I what I thought was really like considering, you know, you discussed at some point briefly the possibility of sub agents with uh, enhanced cognitive abilities that might perform calculation that we cannot perform and so on. So I was really thinking more of the process of acquiring knowledge that somehow needs to consider other scenarios in order for us to classify it as a priori or a posteriori, not really the object of knowledge, not the proposition that is known. Because yeah. you were insisting, and I think, as I said, I'm sympathetic with the overall idea, but you were insisting on, let's say, um, sense-related factors in saying a proof or in performing or recognizing a proof like pattern recognition and so on and was saying that maybe for someone who's friendly to the traditional distinction one way to uh you know somehow insisting that the distinction is still non-superficial is to say well but i could if i go to another situation where my cognitive abilities are enhanced perform everything in my head but of course if i have to detect you know, the color of an object and I don't have the input of that color, that even if I enhance my cognitive abilities, that remains something that, you know, a knowledge is precluded to me. Not again, because of the object, the proposition that I know, but how can I know things in the actual scenario or in another possible scenario? So this yeah. is the way which I was I mean, So, so I, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not sure that as we're just, thinking about what what agents vastly superior to um to us can can do i mean i'm not sure how much light that really casts on a distinction which is meant to be but i take it between different uh types of knowledge or justification that are available uh to uh to us um and you know, and and then in the case of um, the that you were giving about the 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 the, the, the color of something that's on the other side of, of a of a wall. I mean, you know, um, so so maybe um, you know, maybe maybe we can imagine. Um, Imagine beings which which have, you know, vastly more powerful eyes than than 
um, than we have that can, you know, for example, can go out on stalks and, and somehow penetrate into, I mean, you know, but, but what would, I, I'm not sure what that would, so, I mean, we could, and certainly, um, the, you know, I mean, there doesn't seem to be anything as were well impossible in principle about that kind of thing, but I'm just not sure what it, what light it would cast on, on the knowledge that, that we that we have so i mean it's it's not it, it's not as though it, it's something that's that's different um in you know in principle um between the a priori and the a posteriori i mean you know in, in both um you know we can consider vast in, enhancements of of what we what we have um yeah, okay, sorry. I don't want to take too much time, but thanks. Uh, okay, uh, let's go to Silvia de uh, So, uh, Silvia de Toppoli. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you so much. That was a, a very uh, exciting talk. Uh, I guess, like, I wanted to say that I'm totally on board with the account of mathematical practice and the I recognize the real importance of pattern recognition, of notation, and so most of my work has been in the epistemology of diagrams. So I really care about that kind of stuff. And nevertheless, I want to push back with respect to the general mod, uh, moral. And in particular, I was wondering whether we can actually make this discussion without giving a more fine-tuned, precise definition of what experience and dependence is. And here I'm thinking uh, about the analogy with uh, Tyler, Tyler Burge's uh, account of memory, and in particular, the role of memory in mathematical proofs. And uh, I would like to use an extension of that to show, in fact, that the math case is very dissimilar compared to the perceptual case. So to argue against, in fact, your point. So according to Burge, memory plays a preservative role, so an uh, enabling role in proofs. And similarly, I want to say, uh, visual experience with respect to pattern recognition, diagrams, or whatever you want, could play an important role, even maybe a necessary role. But maybe this is just an enabling or preservative role with respect to justification. Um, so then, uh, one way also to, to see that, I think, is the following. We could imagine that we are inspecting a diagram or a piece of notation uh, visually, but I think that the justification we would have is the same if the diagram is there, if the diagram is offline, as you were mentioning, or if the diagram is even hallucinated in some sense. So I think like when we talk about visual imagination, it's not already clear whether that is going to give us a priori or a posteriori justification. That's going to just depend on the cases. Of course, in some cases, visual imagination, when I imagine, oh, will that desk fit in my new office? Something like that uh, would provide me with a posteriori uh, or at least a clear case of a posteriori justification. But that's not always the case uh, in, in the mathematical uh, in the mathematical examples. So in some sense, I'm suggesting that there are two uh, claims that one could, could hold that might appear to be intention, but in fact, they are not. One is that diagrams and notation play a justificative role in mathematics. But the other one is that visual experience itself just play an enabling role. So I was wondering whether you have some reaction to this kind of line of uh, thought. Yes. Well, so the, I mean, in, in some of the cases that, that I was talking uh, about, um, I mean, the, the, the crucial um, step was the identification of an an instance of modus ponens, um, and and I and identifying um, it as a case of modus ponens, I think that's that it, it that can't just be enabling it's, it, itself. I mean we, that that that's the actual bit bit where where all the the, the, the 
crucial work gets gets done. Um, and and so um, so this as were the I mean the, the I mean the trouble the trouble is that um, I mean, I, th I think I, th I think this is what I was, uh, in effect, you know, engaging with when I was talking about trying to make the distinction between form and and content. Um, and I think that that Burge has something like that in mind when when he's when he's talking about as well the enabling stuff because the enabling stuff. Um, is what enables you, as it were, to get in touch with the contents and so on. But, um, but the what I was what I was arguing was that um, the if we tr if we really try to think that through uh, and as it were to, to think that as it were the real mathematical action is um, is taking place at the level of content. Uh, not at the at the level of um, of form. Um, we're just we're, we're engaging with um, as it were these uh, amorphous uh, contents um, for which we're no longer in a position to to make those those judgments. Um, and so I I don't really see uh, how to um, how to implement the uh, as were the kind of um, picture that uh, that Burge, you know, has in mind that, 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 that to give this kind of cut between the enabling and the and the evidential. I mean, you know, if if it was something like, well, what goes on um, is that um, that everything. First of all, has to be translated into a language of thought or something like that, and then and then and then the real math, you know, the real mathematical action is, is the stuff that happens, you know, w with the language of uh, thought. Um, then, I mean, you could kind of understand that model, but it wouldn't really help because the the um, the, the language of one uh, well, would still be relying on, on on form at the level of the language of um, of thought. I mean, I, I don't actually think that it's a realistic picture of what's going on in 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 in, uh, in, in real uh, mathematics or logic. So I, I don't know whether you have any thought about as well how you how you actually make this cut between the enabling and the and the evidential. Yeah. Can I follow up quickly? Yeah. So. I was thinking actually, I, I'm totally on board with that. So I don't, I think the math action really goes, uh, is, takes place at the level also of visual imagination, let's say. I yes. just want to say that visual perception does not necessarily, does, does not play a justificative role. So we can have cases of where they are, like visual imagination plays a justificative role without thereby having visual perception playing uh, a justificative role. And I think like thinking about cases of hallucinations is uh, enlightening here, because why in perception, like if I, I, I'm justified to think, oh, there's a blue cap in front of me. But then if you tell me, look, you were drugged, like the, that was hallucination, there's no cap, then I lose my justification. But if I think, if I imagine like a mathematical diagram or a piece of mathematics, or like I see it and then somebody tells me, actually there was no diagram in front of you, but I still have like a good mathematical argument that my justification is not therefore undermined. So in some yeah. sense, like, I don't know if this suggestion will work, but I kind of would like to make really a, dis a stark distinction between visual perception and visual imagination. Yeah, but I mean, the, you know, the, so that, that may sound plausible when one's just thinking about, let's say an individual step of um, modus uh, ponens, um, but I mean, suppose you know, suppose suppose that you've you, you've written um, down a you know a proof that goes on for pages and pages, and then you check it through uh, in your you know checking the notebook, and then and then somebody tells you, look, ab about half the time 
when you were doing those checks, you were actually hallucinating. I, I, I don't think that it would be reasonable at that point to, to say, um, yeah, but I, but hallucination is just as good as as, as a, a perception. So um, for for purposes of proof, so so you know, I don't need to worry about that. I mean, I think I think the the, the reasonable reaction would be to say, oh hell, I, I'm going to have to do this all over again. And and I think that that what that particularly has to do with is the um, the sort of coordinating. Uh, function of writing the the way that that it's as it were it, it gives us a, a kind of an uh, it, it fits all these individual steps together in a specific uh, way and and so you know so if you if you were hallucinating a lot of the steps e even if you were as it were in some sense uh, quite totally reliably you know applying your recognitional uh, capacities at the at the you know to to what you were hallucinating, um, I think that 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 you're um, you'd have lost the the you know the epistemic assurance that that you needed at, um, you know at the level of the overall proof because you wouldn't have the assurance that the different bits fitted together. And so so I think in that respect, um, it it's really important that that one isn't. Uh, hallucinating, and it, you know, it, it's just that that you know, for sure, if you if you hallucinate, you know, a, a particular diagram that which you can then use in some proof. I mean, that's that's as good as um, as actually seeing one written on a board because you can because you, <coughs> if you, as long as you can remember the hallucination, you can you can write down the diagram and then you can use it, and so. So there are certain uh, respects uh, in which which the hallucination, you know, is is as good uh, as uh, the diagram. But I think if you, as it were, if you look at the uh, holistic uh, assessment of the the proof, you see that that actually, uh, you know, the, the hallucination it, it's it, it isn't an adequate substitute for perception. And uh, um... thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, the okay, so maybe I, I'll uh, ask a question. Uh, there is one point uh, of your talk that I find, I find uh, particularly interesting, and I just would like to see whether uh, we are on the same page. I think that uh, for for independent reasons, there there is an important distinction that uh, uh, somehow has been neglected in the debate on the a priori. And it, it is the distinction between knowledge that is purely formal of, you know, forms like, uh, for example, logical principles, but it can be like mathematical principles at a very abstract level. Like, for example, I know that uh, from P and from P and Q that I, I can infer Q. And so uh, we can call it like purely formal knowledge, okay? But then there is another kind of uh, knowledge that we can have in a specific case that concern the exemplification of, of those principles, and in which it, which is far less trivial than it's, it is usually uh, assumed. So it, it, it seems to me that uh, that applies both to philosophical reasoning and to mathematical reasoning. So sometimes we we all know that a certain principle is valid, for example, but we discuss about whether or not a certain reasoning is an instance of that principle, and and it seems to me that, it, and, and it seems to me that this second form of knowledge uh, is not guaranteed to be a priori for me because it can involve uh, abilities that are, are typically associated with that posteriori knowledge. So I, I totally uh, in agreement with you on that, and, and I was wondering, in the case of the mathematician that you were. Uh, uh, suggesting at the beginning, it seems to me that uh, one way to uh, to draw the distinction it would be that. So uh, she knows even the day before that modus ponens is valid. So both the day before and the day after, she knows uh, so that, that that modus ponens is valid. So her purely formal knowledge from that point of view is exactly the same 
right? But then maybe she can see that uh, two things, for example, instantiate uh, the same principle, or she can see uh, I mean, a relation that uh, uh, she couldn't see the day before. And that belongs to what I would say is the second kind of knowledge, uh, which is which is substantive kind of knowledge and, and is not reducible to the first one. I, I don't know what, what you think about it. Yeah, so I mean, I so I agree that there that there is this issue um, of recognizing, you know, cases where one already knows that a certain uh, form is is valid, but but then it can be difficult to know um, what what's an instance um, of of that, and, and so I so I agree that there is an an extra. Uh, step there, and of course, it, and you know, if we were talking about non-deductive reasoning, it might, you know, like, like what's a, what's a good abductive argument? It might be very, very difficult to, you know, to, to determine what, you know, what's a good abductive argument and and what uh, what isn't. Um, I'm. I I don't think though that these two types of knowledge are are, are totally um, independent. Uh, of of each other um, because I, you know I think that the way um, that that we that we came to know um, the the validity of the general um, pattern um, it itself involves instantiating the pattern uh, and you know I mean we, we um, it's it uh, it's not as though we that we always knew that these patterns were 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 valid and we um, and um and you know uh, I, and i think you know we 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 need to um as it were to try them out and uh to uh, to apply them and and so on before uh before we really i mean unless we're just simply relying on someone else's authority and then that just pushes it further back that before we really know that these patterns are valid, and so I, you know, I think there's uh, there's a process of a constant um, interaction um, between um, the, the, the as it were what you're calling the formal, the purely formal level, and and the level of instantiation. So that that, that epistemologically, they're they're not at all independent of each other. I mean, what, so w one other point that that I like to to make is that um i mean i don't I, I don't really think that these general i mean it, the uh, when one calls these i mean this of course raises a bunch of other issues but when one calls these um these general principles purely formal um i think that that itself depends on um some uh, assumptions um about um about logical form and you know in my view um which um which constants of the language are treated as logical constants um it, it is really a, a matter of what one wants to hold fixed for the purposes of a given in investigation and and so um so as it were, there isn't there isn't really an absolute um, conception of of the the purely uh, formal um, that you know that for example you know if you take the um, the reflexivity of identity um, that everything is self identical um, if, if one's treating. I mean, for some purposes, one may be treating the identity sign as a logical constant, and then, um, and and then um, for all x equals x, or um, if you, or just the pattern a equals a, uh, will will count as um, as logically valid, and and so you might say, in in, in a sense, it's um, true by virtue of form, but 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 with the same language, but a different form of inquiry, one might want to treat. That that the identity symbol as um, as just an ordinary two place uh, predicate symbol symbol and not a logical constant and then 
and then for all x x equals x would would not be counting as a as a, a formal uh, truth at all. So so I you know I I don't I don't think that there is any absolute distinction between the the purely formal and the not purely formal. Thank you. I think uh, uh, we 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 move on to the to the next question. Uh, who's by Sebastiano Moluzzi. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Hi, Tim. Hi, I, everyone in, in Torino. It's nice to see you even in, yeah. online. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, this is a more probably clarificatory question. Um, uh, so uh, I was a bit confused about the following uh, distinction that it seems to me that is relevant here, but perhaps not so central then. So one thing is to know by proof that P. Uh, another seems to me is to know that something is a proof of P. Okay, and yes. um, so the question that you raised at the beginning of your talk uh, had to do with the former claim whether to know uh, by the proof uh, by a proof that p um, whether or not it is a priori whether it is a significant distinction between and a posteriori knowledge but uh, when you started to elaborate in in on the case and to to imagine the case of the mathematicians uh, what it seems to be involved was the question of whether something is a proof of P. So uh, if there is a difference between these two kinds of knowledge, uh, the question is whether there is, I mean, a constraint, like if it is a priori, a priori knowledge by proof that P, then it should be also a priori knowledge that, a, a pr that something is a proof of P. Um, so do you think that there is this kind of issue or this is totally orthogonal to the question that you were uh, trying to understand? Yeah. I think the, the distinction that you're drawing is perfectly genuine. So that, that um, I mean, of course, um, knowing knowing by proof that P, I mean, that, 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 that certainly doesn't um, imply that um, you know, of, just of an arbitrary X that you know that X is a proof that, that P. Uh, um, I, I yeah. guess the, I mean, the, the, the question, I mean, but the question would be if one knows by a particular proof X that P, then um, does one also have to know that, that X is a proof that P and, um, and, and if the, and, Will the a priority be the same for the for the the two? So exactly. Yes. So I I suspect that in simple cases, um, where 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 it's a sort of easy proof, um, one doesn't actually need to to reflect um, on wh whether this is a proof that P when, when just as it were simply absorbs the proof and uses it um, and um, with, without thinking at the if you like the, at the metallurgical level about the validity of a proof um, but but I think um, when one's dealing with you know challenging mathematics um and where the the validity of a proof is is not um by any means a you know a trivial to um to determine um i think in practice these things um go to together so that um so in the kind of case that i was describing um the the the, the mathematicians um knowledge by proof that p where p is just the content of the theorem um that she'll get that because she knows of this particular uh proof that it is a proof uh that p i mean because she, as it were she's the, the the difficulty of the case has driven her to that that level of reflection um and and so um so, so, so we there will be that 
as well, one of one of the pieces of knowledge will come from the other. And I take it that, um, so of, of course, it, you know, I'm, I'm not, as I say, I, I, I'm not, it's not that, that I feel that it's any part of my brief to, to argue that she doesn't have a priori knowledge uh, um, that that P, um, but but I'm but this is a case where um, she's she knows that um, by proof that P by knowing that this particular proof is a, a genuine proof uh, that P and and so um, of course it, it, if it were that she knew a posterior. She, she, she knew a posteriori that that this is a proof that P, but then from that she, some, she could somehow launder the uh, the proof into a, so she got an a priori not a priori knowledge by proof that P. That, I mean that would be that would be very strange. I mean it's not I think it's not the way that the distinction is um, is usually seen as working. Um, but but it's that's not something that I, that I'm particularly concerned about uh, because I'm, because it's it's not it, it's not been part of my brief to argue that we're that we're making a whole lot of mistakes in classifying these uh things so um but i think i think if it turned out that um that although we classified it, it um as a priori knowledge but by proof that p but nevertheless we, we said well a whole lot of um, visual recognitional capacities have been used in knowing that X is a proof that P, which is how she knows mm -hmm. by proof that P, then I, I think that would be sufficient for my uh, purposes because it would it would just show the, the, the crucial role that um, these uh, perceptual systems were playing in the, the knowledge by proof that P, even though that we, we were still class, classifying that as, as a priori. So I, as I say, I, I'm... I'm totally granting the distinctions that you're making, uh, but I don't okay. think that they undermine the, the the argument. Okay, thank you. I mean, then it remains open in what sense exactly is still a priori by proof that P, because, uh, but, but yeah, that was uh, exactly yes. my, my question. So thank you yes. for, for so, answering. Yes, and so of course, I mean, one, one possibility is that that somebody that starts reacting uh, to these cases um, by by reclassifying mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, as things that we'd, we'd normally thought of uh, as um, as a priori, as a posteriori, and so on. And um, and so I haven't I haven't been particularly arguing ag against that. I mean, I think well, obviously, if it turns out that that virtually nothing remains on the a priori side that then we're obviously not dealing with a with a particularly useful uh, distinction um and but what i've what i've just been granting for the as it were for the sake of argument is that um that the a priori a posteriori distinction as it were extensionally it it applies in roughly the way that friends of the distinction think it uh, applies. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tim. There is another question from the room here. Um, so this is not really an objection to the main claim. It's just a question. I'm curious, like, how strong you think the similarity is between um, knowledge by sites and, for instance, know that something is a proof by sites, and in particular, the claim that I guess visual recognition of capacitors are involved. So I was thinking, uh, one might think a paradigm case of knowledge by sight uh, is coming to know something about an object by seeing it. And so I was wondering whether you you think that uh, in the case of knowing that something is approved, uh, visual recognition of classicals are involved in that way, uh, in, in that case as well. Uh, but moreover, moreover, we also uh, apply this, this visual recognition of capacities on the basis of seeing the things that we come to know about. And so I guess whether you would really be happy to say that uh, we see a proof and we come 
to know about it or whether this claim is, is unnecessary or doesn't make sense. And so this is one of the differences that the Renaissance maybe doesn't in your, your main thesis. Yes. Yeah, so so I think you're so if as I understand the question, it's it's a question about whether, as it were, we've we've got object seeing um it, when we learn things about proof. So th th as it were, that just as you know, when when typically when you see that something is a is a dog, you you actually see the dog. Um and and so it's whether when we in these cases we see that 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 it's a, a valid proof that we actually see the proof. Uh, itself. I mean, um, I, I'm i not averse to saying that that you do see the, the proof, but it's, I mean, of course, you know, there are a, whole, there are a lot of um, sort of tricky um, cases, you know, for example, when, you know, when you see um, a, a photograph of somebody. I mean, when, when, you know, do you see the the person themselves? Um, and I, well, I suppose in that case, we, I guess we tend to say no. And and so if yes, if, if we're being strict, but, but um, you know, but I think it, it it would be it would be pretty natural, you know, for, for a mathematician to say something like. Oh, by the way, I, I I saw that proof that you'd written on the board uh, the other day, and and you know I, w I wanted to ask you something about that. I mean that that would that wouldn't seem like at all a strange thing to to say. And um, I I don't have a strong view about whether we're using the word um, the word C in some kind of um, sloppy. Um, sense there and you know i mean an, another kind of uh, example is um you know is where um you know if, if we we might in a bookshop we might talk about um can you know can you see naming and necessity on the sh the shelf and or something and um and you know i mean somebody might insist well it's not really n naming and necessity the book written by Kripke but a particular copy of it that that you see on the on the shelf I mean, you know and then you know think that you can't um see the book it's, but but I mean I you know I, I don't I don't really see that that um there's any strong basis for for insisting that one that one can't um one can't see, um, I guess, what abstract objects in the case of, um, I mean, somewhat abstract objects in the case of book types. You know, if I, if, um, you know, if if one said that, you know, I've 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 never, um, I've never seen um, naming and necessity in a, you know, in in a bookshop um, in Boston or something. <laughs> um, but you know that, I mean. That seems that seems fine. So, um, so I just, I'm mean, sorry. This is a rather indecisive. Uh, uh, but, but I, I, I don't. It's not that I feel that I must insist that that one does literally see the proof, as opposed to you know a, a written, a writing down of the proof or something. But I, but, but I don't. I don't. I don't really. I don't think anything. But really bad would happen if one did simply concede that one saw the the proof there, because I think I think we're probably already, uh, you know, in uh, you know engaged uh, in that kind of uh, thing all, all, all already that 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 we're not really purists, uh, you know, about the the objects of. Um, of sight and and so I mean oh, this would also apply I guess with he hearing I mean that you know that um, you know if if somebody you know if somebody says you know I've you know I've 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 never I've never heard the the Verdi Requiem or something like that um, you know it, it would seem like 
crazily pedantic to and and maybe not even correct to insist look the issue is not whether you've heard the the Verdi Requiem is whether you've heard a performance of the Verdi Requiem or something like that I mean that those I, I just don't think that natural languages are are as as fussy as those kind of uh you know philosophical qualms <laughs> might assume yeah that, that that seems fine I I guess I just thought that given given the background of your proposal, it seems fairly natural uh, to take this, uh, I guess, everyday talk of maybe seeing a proof seriously, as in, I mean, we see instances of proofs and instances of proofs are so central to our, uh, I guess, uh, coming to know things uh, by proof. And so it, I guess it just was a kind of extra claim that made sense um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I believe that we have one last question by Alberto Bolzolini. Yeah, thank you, Tim. But that actually, it's the same as Julia's question. It is, uh, uh, I can repeat it. Uh, when you were saying, uh, when you were confronting the two sentences, an instance of the modus ponens is written there, and this is an instance of the modus ponens. To my ear, they are exactly one and the same sentence in which a pronoun refers. Uh, uh, to the very copy that, uh, to the very instance uh, uh, that is written down on uh, on the blackboard. So I would have expected that you would have said that a possible instance of uh, an a priori sentence uh, would have been this is modus ponens or something like that. Where well, these were referring to the type and not to uh, not to the instance. For people that would appear just like Husserl and maybe Biller as well to something like intel, uh, intellectual intuition would say that this is a case of knowledge a priori because uh, no experience in the sense of no perceptual experience is involved, but something very weird and different, uh, which I don't know what it could amount to. So yeah. because there is this difference, as you pointed out in language, that I can point to a certain copy of a book and saying that and also at, in both cases, uh, uttering these, but in one case I refer to the copy, in another case I refer to the type. So definitely there is this uh, this use in language. Yes, yes. So I mean, we've we've got several levels here. We've I mean, we've got the we've got the inscription um, um, that's written down. We've got the the particular instance um, of. Um, of modus ponens that, that the inscription um, it, it is an inscription of, and then we've got the, the as it were modus ponens as the general rule, which, which has um, um, infinitely many uh, instances. And um, and I think I think even when one's talking about modus ponens as the general um, rule, um, you know. You, 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 we could also talk about that as an object of sight, and it, and it, I don't. I don't. I think if we weren't in a kind of super um, fussy mood, it would seem fine, you know. So I, could, you know, if I told somebody, look, um, it's the, the the rule on the on the right is modus ponens, and the rule on the left um, is you know or introduction or something, <laughs> um, it, then you know I, I don't I don't think it would occur to anybody. Um, if you know, if they weren't, if they hadn't been in, you know, in in a very specific type of philosophical discussion, that that anything weird or infelicitous or or whatever had been had been said, it would it would just be, uh, it would just seem like straight, you know, a straightforward, um, true claim. Or if it was false, it would be false because actually the the one that he said was on the right was the one on the left or something like that. Um, so you know, so I think, uh, um. Our, our general ways of talking are, as it were, about these matters are, are, are fairly uh, promiscuous, and um, and you know, and I I I don't see that there's anything um, wrong with that. I mean, you know, and they're all you know, even as it were, at the level that that nominalists are happy with um, the. the or at least some nominalists, but you know, I mean, we we, we talk about you know, but both. Uh, I mean, you can you can see 
Vesuvius, and you can also see an eruption of Vesuvius, and you know, and one of those is is a substance, and the other is an event. So they they belong to totally different ontological categories, and and we're just fine with with saying that 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 we see both of those. So as, as so, I think that these these perceptual terms just don't impose any special sort of ontological. Uh, requirements for for their their objects and um, and you know maybe there is some point at, at, at um, you know I mean I get you know I, I guess if if somebody um, you know if, if somebody had written up a lot of a lot of different sets I mean the or as it were terms designating sets you know. Um, you know, we might. I, you know, I might ask somebody, "Can you see the see the singleton of the null set anywhere on the board?" And and you know, again, that would be totally fine. I, I, um, I think uh, if there are no other questions, okay. Let me thank again, Tim. Uh, thank you very much for this lecture. Uh, maybe we can talk to you. And thank you for for all those who uh, are connected for for listening to this lecture. Um, so I hope the next time uh, there will be occasion for for interacting in in person. Okay. For now, thank you again. Well, and thanks for the great discussion. <laughs> Lots of good questions. <laughs>